Good morning, dear friends. It's been good to be with you these three weeks. I've loved the last several years making this part of my tradition in the summer. I just wish it could have been in person this time. One of my joys in coming here is to fill in for my friend, Wade Hodges. I think many of you know that in another lifetime, he was an intern of mine in Abilene, and I could not be prouder of who he is, and I learned from him and his preaching style. I do hope you know that this month marks the eighth anniversary of when he and Heather came here. I'm grateful to you for the way you've blessed uh, Wade and Heather and their kids, and uh, I hope you'll take a moment to say thanks to them for these important eight years. He and I have teamed up for this little series thinking about Israel in exile. In 587 B.C., when Jerusalem falls, the Babylonians take many of the Israelites up to the north, to Babylon, what we would call Iraq today. And their people are introduced to Babylonian gods, Babylonian economies, Babylonian narratives. And if you're not careful, you stay in that long enough and you kind of grow used to it. And images of home start to fade. And it becomes less and less likely that that might even ever happen. And it's in exile that you have to go through these powerful emotions of grief, like Jeremiah speaks about, or repentance, where you have exposed not only the idolatries of the past, but the idolatries that you face now, as Ezekiel speaks about. But particularly these three weeks I've been here, we've looked at the words that come ringing through the air from Isaiah 40 to 55. 16 chapters of hope. 16 chapters where God says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Bring the mountains down, fill the valleys, make a highway for the people of God to come home. We saw a song that was sung in chapter 40 about God as the all-powerful God, more powerful than creation and nations and rulers and idols. Last week we went to Isaiah 43 and 49 to hear the tender images of a God who cares deeply and will never leave you or forsake you. Our text today comes from Isaiah 49, verses 5 and 6. And now the Lord says... He who formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I'm honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. He says, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. I'll make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. There's a word in this text that's precious to me. Almost no word sits more deeply in my religious identity than the word restore. I was born and raised in a small church in southwest Missouri in the Ozarks. It was a church that took deep appreciation for its restoration movement roots, the same roots that this church has. Growing up, I had one of the purest forms of understanding that, at least as it came to be known, that restoration meant that we weren't going to look around at all of the things happening religiously, but we were going to go back to the beginning and try to restore the early church. We were a restoration movement. And quite often we described it this way. Back there someplace was a pure body of water. But as the water began flowing out through the decades and then centuries, it became polluted. So here we are today with this water all around us. We hardly want to drink out of it and we probably can't get all the pollutants out. No, what we want to do is go upstream to the source back to the unpolluted waters. 
I'm not making fun of this heritage. As I said, not only did it sit close to the bone for me, but it still does. I still love the dream that it represents. But we found some things as the years went along, or certainly for me and my personal journey. One is that there is a bit of deception on my part when I think that there was an unpolluted source back there. Because if you go back and look at the early church, you remember they were full of messes from the beginning because church is church. Is church. church is going to have its struggles and its misunderstandings at any time. Another problem was that it was so easy to become arrogant, to become self-deceptive and think we and we alone have discovered the truth about this and others are far on the outside and it's that arrogance that led to a kind of exclusivity that we and we alone are the people of God. But that's not necessarily what the restoration movement was. It was not about being the only Christians, it was about being Christians only, about being followers and pursuers on the way of Jesus Christ. Having said that, I still love the word restoration, especially now as I understand some deeper nuances of it, that restoration doesn't necessarily mean going back and getting things exactly right, but it's mending of things that are broken. It's healing of places that need care. It's putting something back together that's been broken into a thousand pieces. I like the idea of restoring. And I'm guessing a kind of restoration movement if it's what all of you want. We want things to get back to normal. We want to restore it. You'd like to be back in this building with one another. You want to restore assemblies the way they were. You'd like to restore the programs that you love and are involved in. You'd just so many things. You'd like to sing with one another. We, we want things to get back. In fact, we talk often about when can the church meet again? When will things be back to normal in our society? When can we tuck our face masks away? We want things restored. And if we were in Babylon in the 6th century B.C., some of us, if we haven't forgotten home, would be wondering... When will we be restored? When will God make good on God's promises to the people of David? When will we come back to Jerusalem? When will we leave Babylon and be back in the homeland? When is God going to restore it? And the surprising part of Isaiah is that God says, your dream's too small. Restoring is a wonderful thing. You'll mount up with wings like eagles. You'll run and not grow weary. You'll walk and not faint. You will come on the highway of God back to the place that is there in your memory. But just getting things back to normal, God's got more grandiose dreams than that. God says that restoring Jacob or putting Israel back where they were, that's not nearly enough of a dream. And then the language that follows tells us why. And it's language that really takes us back into the very beginning of the Bible, to Genesis 1, where God creates the heavens and the earth. And then Genesis 1, 2 says that the earth was... And then there's a Hebrew phrase. The earth was tohu wabohu. Tohu wabohu. And you don't have to know any Hebrew to know that cannot be good. Tohu wabohu sounds bad. And it, it was, it was chaotic. It was a primordial chaos that needed taming. It was deep, it was dark, it needed something. And what it needed was the voice of God who addresses that chaos, that tohu wabohu, with these words Let there be light. And so we find out in the very beginning that the chaos that is there sitting on the surface of the earth needs to be addressed by the voice of God. God must speak light into that kind of darkness. 
that Hebrew phrase only appears one other time in the Old Testament. It's in Jeremiah, which Wade preached on a few weeks back. Jeremiah looks around, surveys the devastation that's come from Babylon. And in Jeremiah 4, 23 says, I looked at the earth and it was tohu wabohu. It was like chaos all over again. And he says, I look at the heavens and there's no light. Well, you can see why those are paired because it echoes Genesis 1 that when you have tohu wabohu, what you need is light. But he doesn't see the order that's needed. He doesn't see the light. And I might add that for many of us, this unusual year has felt a little bit tohu wabohu-ish. It's felt chaotic, out of control. Just, just when you think nothing could be worse than a virus spreading everywhere, you find out that millions of people are without a job and the rippling implications of that. And then, as if that's not enough, we unmask the decades, the centuries of systemic racism. And here we are, hunkered down, trying to deal with this world. It feels like chaos has returned. So perhaps it's not surprising that in the New Testament, Jesus is known as the light of the world, John 8 and verse 12. In, in Matthew 4, when he goes to Capernaum, they find old words from the early part of Isaiah to describe it well, that there's a light shining in the darkness. People in the darkness have seen a light that there's a dawning taking place. Wherever he went, he was God in the flesh. He was light among us. John opens his gospel eloquently by telling us about it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things that were made by him, and without him, nothing was made that's been made. In him was life, and the life was the light all humankind and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. It's sometimes pointed out that there's not a lot of evangelistic emphasis in the Old Testament. You don't get a lot of passages that sound like the Great Commission. You do get the book of Jonah you find out that while somebody like Jonah may want to keep all the little toys to himself and the people of God here, God, on the other hand, cares about the people in Nineveh as well as every other place. But not a lot of great commissions in the Old Testament. And yet, once you start reading the Old Testament as a narrative, as a story that's got a flow to it, what you find is that there is a concern for the world that undergirds all of it. That when there is a problem all over the world and there is brokenness, God's answer to that in the beginning is to tap one man on the shoulder and his family and to pour his blessing into that family so that that family then might pass the blessing on to all the nations. I think you can argue that the central figure in the Old Testament, besides God, of course, is not Moses, it's Abraham. It's God undoing the problems that are there, God bringing together the heavens and the earth, God restoring his world. And so he calls Abraham and his family, pours blessings and covenant upon them so that through them he might bless all nations. Now God says... It's time to take that calling seriously. I'm not bringing you back into the land just to restore you, Jacob. It's too small a dream, Israel, for you to come back to Jerusalem and be satisfied with the way things were. Oh, no, you're coming back to your calling. Which is why the rest of the verse says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. It's the very passage that Paul and Barnabas picked up on in Acts chapter 13. They're on the missionary journey. They come to Antioch and Pisidia. 
There's this eloquent sermon with mixed response. Many of the Jews didn't like it. Because all of us are a little bit that way. As long as the blessings are for me and my people, that's fine. But if you're talking about blessings to others, we have a problem. So they're raising questions. Are you sure that is what Scripture is really about? And Paul and Barnabas go back to Isaiah 49 and verse 6. And they say, it's anchored in the prophets. And the prophets are anchored in the calling of Israel. And so they quote it there, that you are to be a light to the Gentiles. So that through you, salvation might go to the very ends of the earth. It makes sense then when in the New Testament we find out that not only is Jesus the light of the world, but we've been called on to reflect that light. So Jesus says in the serpent on the mount, you're the light of the world. Well, we all know that we're not light of the world like Jesus is the light of the world. He is God in the flesh, and yet as we are filled with him, as we commit to his way, as we follow that, he says, but you are the light of the world. You bear that image. You reflect the light of God. You, at the very least, like the moon reflecting a much greater light so that you look at it and say, there is light. When we know the truth, that the truth is we're reflecting the one who's raised from the dead. The church is the light of God for a purpose. I think of the decades that God has planted this church here. And through the years, the faithful way you've lived out the gospel, you've spoken about the gospel, you've given to wonderful causes. That's that's the meaning of this. And sometimes it's huge things. It's supporting missionaries. It's evangelistic campaigns, but quite often it's quieter. In fact, often people don't even notice that it's the daily ways in which you go out and represent God in this world. And it's a reminder. Some people think, what? what's my life about? Well, I get what Wade's doing. I get what the other ministers here are doing or evangelists around the world is doing. Maybe my job is to put some money in the collection tray. And, of course, we all want to be generous. And yet, the claim of the Bible is much larger than that. You don't just support people bringing light to the world. You are the light of the world. You are not just what it may appear to some people to be. You're more than all that. So somebody shouldn't say, I'm, I'm just a housewife. Like, are you kidding? You're not just a housewife. You're part of the people of God. You're the light of the world. You echo that in the way you work in your world there, the way you treat people, the way you connect. You're not just a nurse, just an accountant, just a driver of trucks. You're not just a cop. You're not just a public school teacher. You're not just, you're not just anything. We're all caught up by God into something that ultimately matters. You are not just that. I'll tell you what you are. You are a bearer of light as God seeks to continue to battle the tohu wabohu in the world. In fact, I wonder if we could get stickers for that. The battler of tohu wabohu. That would start conversations. God has you in this world, and he's pouring your blessing, his blessings into you. Because through you, people see the greater light. And through you, salvation goes even to the very ends of the world. I love the word restore. In fact, in a much deeper sense... I guess we could come back and say that is ultimately the word that fits. In fact, it's the word that's picked up in Acts 3, where it describes the whole work of God as leaning forward inexorably toward the restoration of all things. That the day is coming when God will take all, all things that have been infected 
and he'll heal them. He'll take all the lost pieces and he'll find them. God will take all broken things, put them back together. In the meantime, we follow God in this work. We join him in the work that's going on even now as the gospel spreads, as the living of a gospel life takes place, as relationships are healed, as lives are changed, as perspectives become gospeled. We're participating in that. It's going to be wonderful the day when everybody is back gathered together here. But maybe a moment like this becomes a rebooting kind of time. When we come back together and we're asking larger questions about what life's about, how quickly it goes, how vulnerable we are to something like a virus. And it could be that those very questions cause us to dig down just a little deeper and say, okay, maybe getting back to normal is not the ultimate goal. It's a time to discern. Because as God said, to the people in exile. It's too small a goal for me to restore you, oh Jacob. It's, it's too small a goal, a goal for me to bring you back together, Israel. No, you're a light to the Gentiles, and through you, salvation will spread to the very ends of the world. Amen.